Well, I'm going to shorten the Advent season because I'm going to preach from the Christmas gospel this morning. Actually, it's more of an Advent theme, but it does, uh, or it is based in, in uh, part of the angelic choir's announcement and praise to God. It's found in Luke chapter 2, verses 14. Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those who have his good will. Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those who have his good will. When we were living in Ottawa, Illinois some years ago, the first year that we were there, we enjoyed a series of 20, I think it was, it might have been 24, but anyhow, at least 20 paintings that were put up on the west side of Washington Park, the same park where Lincoln and DeBate had one of their first uh, um, debates. Anyhow, um, we enjoyed those pictures that year, but there was a lawsuit that these needed to be removed from public grounds because they depicted a religious setting. And in the initial case, those who sued to have the paintings removed won. That began a, a series of, of appeals then that continued to go on up the, the level to higher courts. The second year we were there, the, the park had the holders because they had been permanently put into the ground, but no paintings. And I don't remember if it was the third Christmas or the fourth that we were there, but as these appeals reached higher and higher levels, finally the Supreme Court decided that it was an exercise only of free speech and that it wasn't anything that, that was necessarily promoting religion because the state wasn't sanctioning it. it. They were private paintings that were put up. In fact, well, it doesn't matter. And they were private paintings that were, that were put up. And so... By the next year then, the, the paintings depicting the life of Christ were there. Now, one of the things that, that came down in that decision was that those with dissenting opinions also have right and access to use the park. And with that in mind, then, a group of atheists from Madison, Wisconsin, came down and they placed two banners in the park in protest of the decision and as an exercise of their own free speech. One banner read, Jesus Christ is a myth. The second declared, religion is divisive. Now, they were only at the most half right. Jesus is not a myth. He really came into this world. His appearance and his life's ministry are recorded for us in Holy Scripture. So Jesus is not a myth. But sec that second statement, Jesus or religion is divisive, that might be true. In fact, even Jesus, it would appear, concurs with that statement because he said in Matthew 10, 34, do not think that I came to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now, why would he say that? Because we call him the Prince of Peace. In fact, as Isaiah prophesied of the Messiah, he said, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And he goes on and says, There will be no end to the increase of his government and peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Well, was Jesus the Messiah? Yes, without question he was. So did he forget about this statement concerning the Messiah from the prophecy of Isaiah? No, definitely not. The fact of the matter is that there are two different types of peace that are being referred to in these two passages. One is political in nature and the other is spiritual in nature. Now Jesus can bring both kinds of peace. His religion does not have to be divisive, but it will be not because Christianity is necessarily divisive in itself, but it will be divisive when people resist the truth of God as it applies to their hearts. 
and those and when those with the truth would attempt to force others to accept it or at least to submit to it. And the point being that political peace is never enough. And what Jesus really offers is a much deeper peace, a much more significant peace. Jesus offers, first of all, the peace of forgiveness and justification. In Acts 26, 14, we read, And when he had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. Saul refused to accept the Christian message. He thought that they were enemies of God. He made it his sworn mission in life to eradicate every Christian if it would be humanly possible to do so. And he had no peace. He would have no peace until he could accomplish his goal. But God had other plans for Paul. And he met him on the road to Damascus. Jesus was going to round up Christians and prosecute them. Jesus meets him there and says it's hard to kick against the goads. Why are you persecuting me? And during the next few days then, as he was taken into the care of a man named Ananias, he came to know Jesus personally. He was baptized in scales, it says, fell from his eyes, and all of a sudden he was able to see, not only physically again, having been blind, blinded by the bright light in which Jesus appeared to him on the road, but he also now could see spiritually. And Paul then became one of the most avid gospel presenters the world has ever known. He had peace, but his life was devoted to carrying the gospel to the world. And he writes in Romans 5, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul came to know that peace, that settledness in his own heart and soul, because he knew that things were settled between him and God. Jesus had paid the price for his forgiveness. The Holy Spirit had been given to him as a gracious gift of God. And now this God had given him the honor of taking that gospel and sharing it with others. He knew the peace of forgiveness and justification. And many of you here today know that same peace. You know what it is to be personally forgiven of your sins, to be justified before God because of what Jesus has done so that God can look on you as though you've never sinned, and so that he can put his Holy Spirit in you, and you can have that peace that passes understanding. There is further the peace of God's abiding presence. Jesus promised his disciples in John 14, the last night of his life with them. Later that evening, he would be arrested as he was betrayed and, and would be um, put to death the next day. But he said to the disciples, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. What a, what a wonderful promise Jesus made that he would not leave believers as orphans. Even though he would no longer be physically present in the world, the presence of God would be experienced in a most intimate way as he would come to the hearts of people and indwell them there. So that Jesus could say later on in the same chapter, John 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, I do not give that to you. Let your hearts not be troubled, nor let it be fearful, because he gave his peace in the presence of the abiding Holy Spirit. And God's presence can assure us then peace amid any circumstances. Paul prays for Christians and says, Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. That's from 2 Thessalonians 3, 16. Does that mean our lives will be smooth sailing? Does it mean everything will go the way we want it to go? Not hardly. We'll face difficulties. We'll face hard times. 
But whatever we face, whatever we pass through as believers, we can know that again, his Holy Spirit will continue to abide in us and will continue to give us that peace that passes understanding so that we can face whatever comes and do so hopefully and joyfully. J. Oswald Sanders once said, peace is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of God. Isn't that good? I love that. Peace is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of God. In John 16, 33, we read, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world, and I give you peace then. A reporter once asked President Herbert Hoover after his presidency, he said, Mr. President, how can you handle criticism? Don't you ever get agitated or tense? And Hoover replied, no. Of course not, he said. The reporter went on, but when I was a boy, you were one of the most popular men in the world. Then for a while, you became one of the most unpopular men with nearly everyone against you. Didn't any of this meanness and criticism ever get under your skin? And the president answered, no. I knew when I went into politics what I might expect, so when it came, I wasn't disappointed or upset. And then he made this statement. He said, besides, I have peace at the center. And for Hoover, that peace was the abiding presence of God. He was a believer. He knew what it was to have peace in the midst of very difficult circumstances. And the word of God promises to you and to me who are his children, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 7. That's one of those verses that I think we should all put to memory to just be reminded again that the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And it will enable us to live holy lives for his glory. In Luke 1, 79, we read, to shine upon those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. That was part of the ministry of the Messiah when he would come, of Jesus specifically, whose birth was being foretold then. He will guide us into the way of peace. And in Isaiah 26, verse 3, we read these wonderful words. The steadfast of mind, thou will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in thee. The steadfastness of mind is the focus of faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we continue to focus on him and trust him amid whatever circumstances we may face, he will keep us in perfect peace. In first, first, excuse me, first Thessalonians 5.23, we read, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. To sanctify us completely, to continue that work of renewing the image of Jesus in your life and mine so that our lives, our actions, our words, and our attitudes might more closely reflect those of the Savior whom we trust, that we might be able to bring honor to him in our lives, by holy lives. And he also, as he gives us his spirit, would work or grow these fruit in our lives. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How many of you Black Friday shopped? Not that many. A few of you did. Okay. This is a smarter congregation than I thought. No. <laughs> uh, I, when I think of Black Friday, and I, and I think of, of the masses out shopping, I don't think much about that there's a whole lot of evidence of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. 
Years before I went into seminary, I worked at a place called Munsing where they used to have a production facility in the near north side of Minneapolis. And on Fridays, they had an employee discount available to all employees to go into the store. Well, actually, it was every day of the week, excuse me, Monday through Friday. But on Fridays, once a month, they opened the employee store to the outside world. And believe me, there was no peace, there was no gentleness, <laughs> there was very little joy. I'm not kidding you, I can remember having a shirt over my arm and another lady came and just grabbed it from me and she gave me a look that made me think, go ahead and have it. I don't need it that bad. <laughs> so much of what the world does is devoid of any of these things. So much the world needs these things. The fruit of the Spirit, that love might be shown to others, that joy in the midst of circumstances that are difficult, that peace that anchors our soul, as the writer of Hebrews speaks about, that patience with others, that kindness toward our fellow man, that goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, how the world needs to see these blessed virtues and the Spirit of God can and will produce them in us. And by the way, the word fruit in Galatians 5.22 is in the singular. That doesn't mean that he wants to produce love in you and joy in you and peace in you and patience in one of you back there. No, he wants the whole cluster, if you will, to be grown in each of our lives so that each of us, as the Spirit of God works in us, might display this fruit to others, the love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. And that can lead us to practicing a brotherly love. Media mogul Ted Turner wanted to see if anybody has a real vision of a future world at peace and in harmony with the environment. He said his quest ended in disappointment. He told an Atlanta gathering in May of 1993 that he had funded a competition to find a book that gave a workable plan for a world of peace. Here's a quote from him. He said, with 10,000 manuscripts, we did not have one plausible treatise on how we could get to a sustainable, peaceful future. This is what he told the, the, the a gathering of the Turner broad, Broadcast System. And he said, without a plausible plan, uh, plan, a feasible plan, the prospects of creating peace are grim. He says, you've got to have a vision. And then he says, we can achieve it. Isn't that quite a statement after reviewing 10,000 books and finding no hope? And he says, yeah, we can achieve it. Well, you know what? He didn't have to read 10,000 books. He could have read just one. This book, the Bible. Because God has a plan for peace. And it's a peace that would come to the individual and be shared by that individual with someone else so that that person could come to know peace. And it would go on and on and on. And isn't it interesting that despite all attempts to, to squelch the Christian message, to take paintings out of the park, and to prohibit free speech, the gospel continues to go forward and lives continue to be changed and the kingdom of, excuse me, the kingdom of God continues to grow. Not here, or not only here, but throughout the world. That's why we are admonished in Scripture to pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14. And in Hebrew, or Romans 12, 18, Paul says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And again, I quote, this verse that I, that I started with this morning, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. That's the desired benediction of God on this sin-lost world, that people might come to know the Savior, might come to know his abiding presence, might come to know and experience that peace that passes all understanding, because Jesus is 
the Prince of Peace. And his religion doesn't have to be divisive. It can bring you the most important peace and keep you in it, that spiritual peace, that peace within your heart. And may you know God's peace throughout this Advent season because of a relationship with Jesus. May you know the peace that comes from being justified and forgiven. May you know the peace of God's abiding presence in you and with you. May you know the peace that is yours despite whatever circumstances you might face. Might you know the peace that would also encourage and motivate you to live your lives for him. And may you be able to spread the peace of brotherly love to those around us. See, peace is not found in an ideal. Peace is not found in a principle. Peace is found in a person, the person of Jesus Christ. In this Advent season, I invite you anew to come to Bethlehem and see. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came into this world, that you came to change our lives, to bring us peace, to help us live in peace, to help us promote peace, to help others come to experience it for themselves. Thank you, Lord, for that peace. Thank you that you desire it to rest upon us, to be a part of our daily lives. And thank you that you can continue to change lives. And we pray that you might do so through us this Christmas season. In Jesus' name we pray it.